Hebra, how are you? <clears throat> it's now Tiny Esther in Melbourne already, and we're going to speak a thought for the festival. Concerning Purim, <clears throat> excuse me, concerning Purim in particular, the relevance is very important. First of all, there's a famous Torah, the Baal Shem Tov, where he said, <laughs> which the literal meaning is, the law is that if a person reads any of the verses in the Megillah out of order, then he didn't fulfill the obligation of listening to the story of Purim or listening to the Megillah. The Baal Shem Tov said, <laughs> Whoever reads the Megillah and thinks it's a story that happened a long time ago, but it doesn't have meaning at present, <laughs> he wasn't Yotza, he didn't fulfill his obligation. And concerning Purim in particular, as we'll discuss later, the Pasik in the Megillah actually says that this was a holiday that was forever, as the Pasik says, by Yomim Medina Medina as the Pasuk says in the Megillah, and these days should be remembered and celebrated by every generation, every family, every province, and every city. And these days of Purim should never cease among the Jews, nor shall their remembrance perish from their descendants. So we hear, in particular, the Torah tells us how important this idea of the permanence and the eternal message is something they have to think about and to internalize, etc. So obviously, the main question is, what is the lesson of Purim? And as we all know, the lessons of Purim touch upon the very survival of the Jewish nation, the immortality of the Jew. So it's very, very fundamental, and that's what we'll talk about today in Mir Tzashem. But first, we'll start with the Pasek. And this is going to be a Pasek that we are going to speak about today, amongst other things in our thought. And that's the Pasek, and it's especially relevant now, concerning the situation in Ukraine with our brothers and sisters. And the Pasek is, Al tira mi pachat pisoim, o mi shoyim kisavoi. Hashem tells the Jewish nation, do not fear sudden terror, and do not fear the destruction of wicked people when it comes, because nothing will harm us. So, this Pasuk has especially relevance to Purim, because, and what I'm going to tell you today, is a synopsis of a Sikh of the Rebbe, in Chelek Chof Aleph. So, it says over there a story, an interesting story, that Mordechai, he brings, the Rebbe brings a medish that Mordechai already had heard of the plan and knew of the plan that Haman had already successfully made a day which was going to be International Kill Jew Day and everything was signed, sealed, over, so to speak. And Mordechai was walking along and he saw three children that were coming from yeshiva. And he asked them, what did you learn today? So he asked one, and one child said, he learned the Pasuk, the verse that we just said, that if there's sudden fear, you shouldn't worry about it. If it comes, etc. That was one child. He asked the second child, what did you learn? And he said, Utsu eitz of sufar, dabru dabru v'leyokum ki manukel. He said that the Goyim will say, you know, organize a plan to do us harm, but it will be canceled. Speak, and it will not stand, because Hashem is with us. And then he asked the third child, what did he learn? And the child answered, That Hashem tells the Jewish nation, <clears throat> I am with you until your old age. I will care for you until you are very old. I have made you and I will carry you. I will care for you and I will save you. When Mordechai heard these three psukim, he was overjoyed and he was very happy. 
So, why was he happy when he heard these psukim from the children? Some commentaries say that it was a sort of prophecy, because it says the prophecy is given to children. So Mordechai saw this as a sign that everything is going to turn out all right. But on this, the Rebbe asks a klotz kasha, a very obvious question, because later on, it says that still Mordechai went into the city, into the town, and it says that he put on sackcloth and he gave a very loud cry. So that's not the actions of a person who's confident that he's heard the good news, that everything will turn out all right. We see that he was worried, so to speak. He's doing such an action. He's dressing as if there's the greatest calamity. And he cried out. So why would he do that if he received this, so to speak, message and sign and prophecy that everything would be good? So that's an obvious question. Also, the Rebbe asks, why did, why did he have to receive a message from three Pesukim? Any one of these Pesukim implies that things will be good and you have nothing to worry about. So the Rebbe learns that these are three Pesukim that talk about three different levels of faith in Hashem, as we'll get to it. But first, let's talk about the story of Purim itself and the relevance and what does it tell us about a Jew? What was the story? How did it come about? So Haman declared himself a deity and he was walking around and he wanted that everyone should bow down to him. And what does the Pesach say? And the Pesach says that Mordechai did not bow down. Mordechai and Mordechai didn't bow down. So when Haman found out and he saw that Mordechai didn't bow down, by Moli Haman he had a terrible rage. And Homan understood that the reason why Mordechai is not bowing down is because that's the essence of a Jew. Yehudi is moide ba'kodesh baruchu v'koyfer ba'avidu zara. What's the definition of a Jew? That he has an unbreakable, invincible bond and loyalty to Hashem, and he takes orders for no one else. A Jew bows before no man. And Homan understood this. And therefore... We have to get rid of every single Jew because the Jew will always be a problem to my nefarious plans, to be able to do what I want. And this is true in all ages. Right now we have the world is completely inspired from a Jew by the name of Zelensky who's standing up to Putin. But the idea is there's always going to be the Jew that's going to get into the way of a tyrant, of a dictator, etc. Hitler Yemach said, the Jews invented conscience. A Jew stands for conscience. Who says this is the right thing? Maybe it's not such a good idea to do this. Who's going to be the one that's going to stand up and say opposition to something which is injustice and immoral? The Jew. And Homer understood this, and therefore he has to eradicate every single Jew. Now, how does a Jew bring out his Jewishness? It's a good question. And this is how the Rebbe explains why Mordechai, even though he already had received this message that things would be good, but he still went and put on the sackcloth and gave a scream and cried out. Why? Because he was worried that maybe this Nekudas Ayahadus, this Pintaliyid, this Neshama, this loyalty, to Hashem, was not revealed by the Jews, because some Jews had Nachman al Sam bow down to Haman. That was the problem. So even though Mordechai already knew that things will turn out all right, but there had to be the process. How are things going to turn out all right when he's going to do his job as the leader to arouse from all the Jew, from the entire Jewish nation, the Neshama, the Pintaliyid, he had to arouse in them the feeling of Mesiras Nefesh, that they're ready to say, and this is the truth, this is the truth about the Jewish nation. 
throughout the ages, when it comes to a do or die moment, a crisis, who are you going to choose? Hashem. That's what it is. And that's why Mesiris Nefesh is a particularly Jewish trait. See Tanya chapter 18. So therefore, when Mordechai put on the sackcloth and gave out the cry, that was to awaken the Yidden. He had to do something. Something that was so terrible, so to speak. Seemed like it was so serious. Let's get serious. We're dealing with a serious situation. We have a decree of annihilation of all the Jews. Wake up! So that's what Mordechai was doing. When he put on that sackcloth, and when he gave out a cry, that cry, that call, that call to bring out the loyalty of the Yidin to Hashem was what it was all about. And it was that cry that aroused by the entire Jewish nation their feelings of loyalty and Mesiras Nefesh for Hashem, and that brought the salvation and nullified the decree. Now, let's go to the three Pesukim. You know, there's the famous song, it's gonna be the little kinderlach. So in the story of Purim in particular, this message is taught us. When Mordechai went to the three children and he heard these three psukim, the Rebbe explains, I'm paraphrasing it, you can look up the Sikh yourself, like I said, Nechil Chafalov. Mordechai saw that there are three levels, three levels of connecting of a Yid to Hashem, and these three children were really one higher than the next. One was like, the first child is like a lower level. In other words, he didn't learn so much. Then there's the second child who learned more, and then there's the third child who learned the most and is in the highest level. The first child is holding by the level of Altira Mipachat Pisan, which means we're dealing with somebody who's already confronting danger. There's danger, and the danger is here and now. The bombs are falling. So that person turns to Hashem, and they're not worried. Ultimately, Hashem is the one who's in control, and therefore, Altira, you don't have to be scared. But that doesn't really tell us that the whole thing will become nullified. It's more just like a negative thing. Altira, don't be scared. Doesn't mean you're necessarily confident. Doesn't mean you're necessarily happy. Doesn't mean necessarily that it's as if Nothing's happening. Comes a higher level. Utsuets of a sufar. That means it's going to be cancelled, finished, destroyed. Whatever plans and nefarious schemes the enemies are making, it's going to turn to nothing. So this is a higher level. This is someone who's more attached and intimate and lives with Hashem. So it's not only when there's an imminent danger, <clears throat> and, and the level of security and confidence is greater because it's not only Altira, but it's like, <laughs> it's like nothing. But then comes the highest level. What are we talking about here? Old age. In other words, we're talking about regular life. There's no emergency no bombs are falling. There's no anti-Semites in our vision, in our sights. But there's the laws of nature. Regular, regular things. I'm getting old. I'm getting tired. There's difficulties. In the business world, there's competition. Whatever, the stuff of life. So what's the highest level? The highest level is that the amuna <clears throat> of the Yid and the confidence and the sense of security is 24-7. He's always with Hashem. He sees Hashem in everything. And therefore nothing faces him. Even the regular laws of the, 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 the world, the laws of creation, the laws of physics, the laws of nature, also doesn't face him. Because it's really Hashem. And Hashem is in control. And if Hashem wants, He could change it. So the main thing is, I have to always connect myself to Hashem, who could perform a miracle, etc., even in the laws of nature. So the lesson of Purim is, that Moshe was reinforced by talking to the children, the children's hevel shem bechet, the breath that has no sin, their innocence, their purity, that rebounds to Mordechai, Mordechai is reinforced. And then this level of the children, 
their emunah pshuta, and their loyalty to Hashem then affects the entire nation. And over here the Rebbe also says another tremendous, tremendous word. Everyone knows the Gemara. The Gemara says, and this itself is also tremendous, to how much we have to appreciate the holiday of Purim. The Gemara says that there was a story of Sinai, yes, Mount and Taira, but the Gemara says, Mikan, Meidor, Isa. There was an argument. There was a flaw, so to speak, in the story of Sinai, in the very most important day of the history of the Jewish nation, when we got the Torah itself, there's a problem. What's the problem? The problem was, one could argue to say, we were forced to receive the Torah. Kof Hashem told us we must accept it. And then the Gemara says, that's what the Pasuk means over here, it was only till almost a thousand years later in the story of Megillah's Esther that we say that now we finally accepted it. Now we really, really accept it totally. So all the commentaries speak about this. In Chassidus, this is discussed in tens of Maimorim. How could we even compare Matan Torah, the Yidin, was, 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 was the climax the greatest day in the history of the Jewish nation. We're a totally free people. That we just went out of Egypt. The greatest revelation of God Himself. And we say, no, there was something wrong with that. Purim, when we're in Golos, by a Goyesh king, and the Kabik Zeris, and still we say that's greater to a certain extent. And the answer is, one of the answers is, that over here it was put to the test. And it came from within, from us. So, I don't want to elaborate now, but the idea of Mesiras Nefesh, you know, there's something where we say, I pledge allegiance, but then when it comes to the test, they say, for example, it takes one second to say I love you, it takes a lifetime to prove it. And this is the point. By Purim, our loyalty was tested and proven. And that's the Chiddush of Purim. Because by Mount Torah, our Mesiras Nefesh was there in Koyach, in potential, but not in actuality. And the point is, actuality. That it should come to actual fruition. You know, in the American army, I heard that there's medals. A person can get medals. Soldiers can get medals. But there are some medals that you can only get if you face actual combat. Because there's simulation and there's actual combat. And you know what? There's some people that do excellent when it comes to simulation, but when it comes to actual combat, for some reason, they jam, they go into shock, they become stifled, they become paralyzed, etc. So when we talk about this idea of actual combat, it's a whole different level. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is the uftu <coughs> of the story of Purim, that we're talking about actual Mesiris Nefesh. And how the Alter Rebbe explains in Torah, Le'ola Machsheves Chodz. It was an entire year, and the entire Jewish nation was constantly connected with their sense of loyalty and attachment to Hashem. They didn't think of any option. It didn't enter their minds to seek a way out. They were completely loyal to Hashem the whole time. And that's why the Kibbal Yehudim, it's only through the story of Purim that Mountain Torah is validated. Unbelievable. Now, the Rebbe adds to this, that in the story of Mount Torah, everyone knows the famous word, that Hashem said He wanted a guarantor. And we said the children are the guarantors, and Hashem accepted that. He didn't accept any other guarantors, but the children. So the Rebbe says in the Sikha, that that also, the real meaning, the full import of what it meant when the Jews by Matan Torah said that the children will be the guarantors, it's really, really referring to the story of Purim. Wow. That's when it was actualized. That's when it was proven. Just like we say concerning Matan Torah in general. That Mikan Midor Abelay Raisa. And we have to wait until the story of Purim to validate, to show the ultimate permanence of Matan Torah that made good. The Kibbalah Yehudim. Esa Sheikh Kibbalah says what they started in Matan Torah. The same thing is in the statement where we say that it's going to be the Kindalach. Baneinu Arevim Badeinu. 
When did that come to fruition? When was that actualized? In the story of Purim. So here we have the lesson. The Rebbe takes, it's very important for all of us who are parents and teachers and leaders, we have to realize, we have to put a very, very strong emphasis on the chinuch of the kinderlach. Imbue them with powerful amuna. Their neshama is pure. They can handle stories of nisim, of miracles. And we have to feed them the faith. As explained in Chesidus, Ur-e-Yamuna. every Jewish leader, every tzaddik, starting from Moshe Rabbeinu, and Mordechai, and the Friedrich Rebbe in the time of Stalin, as the Rebbe explains in the famous Maimah, and the Rebbe in our generation, made Tzivas Hashem, unbelievable. He made an organization that is all about the children, and he spoke to them, and he was constantly fanning the flame of the Neshamis, to be burning bright, to be burning intense, and to be burning powerful. And through the children, being in a state where the Neshamis are shining brilliantly, that inspires the entire nation. And there lies the secret. And by the way, I forgot to mention before, Haman followed Mordechai in the story that I said before with the Medrash. Haman was there and he saw what happened with Mordechai and the three kids. And when he heard the three kids and he saw the way Mordechai smiled and was so happy, Haman said, I'm going to harm the children first. You see, even the anti-Semite, the Rosh Yimach he also knows the power of the Jewish nation <clears throat> is in the children, sorry. So we have to, Kolshkein, all the more so realize that the power is in the Jewish children, in our children. And the Rebbe in the Sicha brings a story of the Baal Shem Tov, a very powerful story. The Baal Shem Tov was an orphan from when he was already five years old. And the Baal Shem Tov recorded the last words that he heard from his father. And the Rebbe brings it down. One thing the Baal Shem Tov's father told him, he should love every Jew. But he also told him, Zot fakenim, un fakein zachet de velt nit meirahabin. You should not fear anyone or anything of this world. Menit fagot alein. Only fear God himself. And I'll tell you a story that happened with me. I was a camper in Camp Gan Yisrael. And I remember once a staff member took me for a walk on the, you know, the road in Parksville, New York, where it's pitch black. I'm talking about a story from uh, 50 years ago, maybe even more. So this staff member took me for a walk on this dark road. And he, I don't know why, but he told me the story of the Baal Shem Tov, that maybe because it maybe because I made a comment that it's very dark over here. Look, we're walking over here in this road where it's pitch pitch black. Anyways, while we're walking along this road, he tells me the story of the Baal Shem Tov, that when the Baal Shem Tov was five years old, his father told him, "You should fear nothing of this world, only Hashem." And that story stayed with me my whole life. Afterwards, I read it, and I got older, but then I was a child, probably, I don't know, seven, eight years old. And this staff member told me the story. So I'm just talking from my own experience. Here I was a child, and this person told me the story, how the Baal Shemta was a child, and this is, was the message that his father gave him. And it left an impression on me all these years. So this is how you have to educate a child. You have to tell them these sort of stories, and it leaves an impression, and then he lives by that. This week, the connection to this Pasha, Pasha's Tzav, is what Rashi says in the beginning, by Dabr Hashem, Tzav is Alem is born of Lamer, and Rashi says that ain't Tzav and Loshan Zidus Miyot, or the Doirais. That when it says Tzav, it tells us that these commandments are for future generations. And this is the lesson that we have to take for Purim. And for this year, and especially now in the situations that many of our brothers and sisters find ourselves, we have to arouse from within us our emuna and our betochen and not let anything phase us. And the schus of our emuna and betochen will come to the Gula Mitzvah Shleima, take it from Yad Mamish, posting from my home, Be'ez Hashem Yisbarach, your man in Melbourne. Kut